Right. Hi, everyone. So we're going to um, kick off our second day of uh, public art now conversations. So for those of you who missed yesterday's event, uh, my name is Dr. Gwanya Coughlin. I'm the coordinator of this event. So just again, a welcome to everybody back to Public Art Now Conversations, or if this is your first time joining us, um, we hope that you stick around for the rest of the programme. So yesterday saw three fantastic sessions exploring the complexities of working in specific ecologies of space and place, be that here on site at the TU Dublin City Campus at Grange Gorman or on the US-Mexico border. We also explored the complexities of policy and provision for public art and the necessity of more nuanced understandings of locale and art making to contribute to the vibrant public art practice. Today, however, we're going to kick off with a conversation exploring the roles and responsibilities of artists engaged in the making of public art, and in particular how artists whose practice is often based in gallery or museum sites can negotiate and adapt to the particularities of working in civic and public space. So once again, I'm going to ask you all to keep your mic muted. Uh, the housekeeping rules for this event are if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q and A function, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any time during the conversation. And our chairs will get to that either throughout the event or at the end of it. Um, you can also use the chat function if you'd like to say hi or if you want to drop in a resource or a link that you think might be useful to our panellists and attendees. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our chair for this event, Barbara Knezovic. Barbara Knezovic is an artist and educator based in Dublin. Her work is primarily sculptural and has been shown internationally in museums as well as public and private galleries. She's a member of the teaching faculty of the Fine Art Department at the Dublin School of Creative Arts at Technological University Dublin. She has recently been commissioned to make public art projects such as They Are All of Us, a sculpture to commemorate the loss of young lives in the Easter Rising at the GPO in Dublin, an artwork commission for children in Cabra Library, and a percent for art project called Collective Energy at Kingswood Community College Dublin. So with that in mind, I think I'm going to pass it straight over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Grania. Um, I'd also like to welcome everyone to this panel discussion, public art and practice, roles and responsibilities of the artist. So as Grania said, my name is Barbara Knezhevich. I'll be co-chairing this conversation with Mary Kremen. Mary Kremen is the director of Void Gallery Derry. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was the commissioner and curator of the Irish Pavilion at the Venice Biennale 2019 with artist Eva Rothschild. <clears throat> she has previously worked as program curator at Temple Bar Gallery and Studios and at the Irish Museum of Modern Art. She was co-director of the Tree Lane Project with Una Young. So we're really fortunate to have a panel of three important contemporary artists working in public art practice joining us today, David Beattie, Alice Rekab, and Eva Rothschild. This panel will discuss the roles and responsibilities of the artist in making of public art, and we'll be considering a series of key questions. What does it mean for artists to engage in the making of, of artworks in the public realm in terms of artistic, ethical, ecological, and social responsibilities? As part of this conversation, I think we'll also be working to define some terms. What do we define as the public realm and who is the public? What are the responsibilities of the artists when making public art in terms of representations of place, politics, gender, sex, race, identity, nationhood, communities, society and culture in public space? So quite a lot to get through. Um, there are, these are just some of the questions um, we are considering today. In terms, in terms of the format of today's uh, panel, we'll be hearing a presentation from each of the artists on their practice followed by a panel discussion, after which we welcome questions from the audience. So um, I'd like to now hand over to Mary to say um, some, some further words and also to introduce our first uh, artist, David Beattie. Over to you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. As a curator, I've commissioned and produced a, a variety of public art projects. 
Uh, I find working within the public realm as a radical space and in a way a process of resistance, albeit it comes with a lot more complexities than working within the confines of a gallery or a museum space. Public art has, as a notion has expanded significantly as post-studio practices. It currently operates under a variety of guises, socially engaged art, community-based art, experimental communities, participatory art, collaborative art, and social practice. Public art engages with a constantly shifting landscape and often challenges traditional orthodoxy. On that note, I would like to introduce David Beatty. David Beatty is an artist and lecturer in art and research collaboration in Dunleary Institute of Art and Design and Technology. Beatty's sculptures practice explores the material world through experiential physical engagements with objects and non-objects. Recent projects have focused on the social and environmental impact of digital technologies, haptic robotics and machine learning. So I'm gonna hand you over to David so he can give you his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and, and thanks to Barbara and TU Dublin for the invite to be part of this discussion. So very exciting. And to begin with, I'm going to share my screen. You can all see that. Um, so I suppose I wanted to talk a little bit about my art practice generally, and then maybe discuss how I have approach making work that is in an outdoor or public context. Um, I work primarily through sculpture and with objects, and quite often the focus of the work is a way of making sense of the physical material world. And the work I make is often site specific or site responsive. Um, but for the most part, it is an attempt to find ways of making the invisible more tangible a way of describing what it is to, to be in the world. Um, and for a number of years, my art practice was the result of studio experimentation and material experiments um, with everyday objects. And this was sort of a way of responding to ideas within physics to do with light, sound, energy, and, and matter. And this work, The Impossibility of an Island, is a work that I made um, during a residency in Ima in 2015. And the symbol hangs from the ceiling and it's attached to a motor that revolves at two revolutions per minute. So it's quite slow uh, rotation. And the, the symbol sort of gently uh, rubs or, or sort of touches off the, the piece of concrete, um, which is a fine piece of concrete, not, not something I, I formed or cast. So. Um, so as these sort of objects interact or sort of engage with each other, they, they make this sort of other thing, they create this physical and um, sonic sort of experience. Um, and I, I suppose I was thinking about these interactions as a way to think about inter interconnections between all matter and maybe that point of contact between things when one thing comes into contact with another thing. This work I made for Tolka Arts Festival, uh, curated by Matt Packer in 2017. And it uses Wilhelm Reich's uh, idea of organ energy as a starting point uh, to think about alternative therapies and pseudosciences as a bridge between the scientific and pre-scientific understanding of the world. It's quite an expansive installation with a, a number of elements and materials borrowed from Reich's idea of accumulating or harnessing organ energy for well-being. So really it acts as a, an invitation to be amongst these materials and objects and spend some time with them. And when I make work for what might be described as art in a public context, um, I find it interesting to think about ways of transferring my interest in sensory experiences to this context. Um, each commission is site specific and as such I place a lot of emphasis on how the work is to be experienced. And for the most part I'm keen to prioritize the experience rather than the physical form of, of, the, of the sculpture. And for example this work called Reflectors in Bray in County Wicklow is a series of cast terrazzo uh, sculptures along a public 
Riverside walkway. And the sculptures are approached from different points along the walkway. And as such, I wanted to find a way of interrupting that flow or that flow of walking or moving from point to point um, that someone might be engaging with in their every day that they're not really sort of conscious of what they're doing. Um, and to really maybe refocus, redirect them, stop and reconsider the, the sort of physical environment that their, their, their bodies are within. And the sculptures are designed not necessarily as, as visual forms, but as listening points. And they're oriented towards the river at different points along the walkway um, to maybe direct your attention or your listening ear towards particular listening experiences. So there are different points in the river that the sound might operate differently, or there might be a series of trees along the riverbank that you know, the wind's passing through it, so it has a different uh, listening experience. So they all are oriented to create these different moments or capture these different moments. Um, and these are my own children. So in case anyone's worried about consent or permission to, to, to give these images. So. And I suppose the other thing about this is that it's sort of like in terms of the transition from or, or thinking about making work in a public context and what you might make in a gallery context. I, I've made a lot of work over the years that thinks about the physicality of sound and sound as a sculpture, as, as a material that, that we experience. Um, and this is a way I felt I could do this in a, in a sort of in a public, more public space outside the Y cube. Um, that maybe thinks about the psychoacoustics of, of, of a built environment and the river. Patterns of Illumination is a work I made for a primary school in Dublin. And the process began during and before the school was built. So uh, there was really an opportunity there to work with the architect and the design team to think about how it is integrated into the, the fabric of the building or, or, or really I wanted to sort of prioritize the, the idea that it wasn't this physical form that sort of has a, has a presence, but something that is maybe integrated into the fabric of the building that becomes hidden in a way. And that in itself sort of speaks about a lot of the work I make, thinks about making invisible things more visible and sort of intangible, more tangible. So, um, so with this, uh, I, I made these window panels uh, in the sports hall. So the windows, the, the panels I made were sort of integrated into the, the, the building windows. Um, so in a way, you sort of don't really notice where, what the art is, what the sculpture is. So really the focus of the work is on the experience. Um, and these narrow windows had this sort of solar alignment, sort of Neolithic aspect to them. And I wanted to heighten that experience. Um, so the, the diffraction grading within the window panels sort of allows you to see the spectrum of colors within white light. And I think it's important uh, to point out that the, the primary audience for, for this work was the school community and um, and maybe what is different about that in dealing with another sort of more wider general public is that I wanted to retain the playfulness within the work and to try and create something that changed and was a different experience throughout their lifetime in the school. So they generally spend six or seven years in a school building. And I wanted to produce something that allowed them to experience it in different um, for that duration. And what's interesting about this particular, like working with the sun and these projections is that it is dependent, the projections are dependent on the angle of the sun in the sky at that moment in time. So every time you enter that space, it has a different pattern or, or sort of arrangement uh, from minute to minute. So I, I sort of, I'm sort of quite interested in trying to achieve that. Um,
I'm currently working on a commission for Boyd Gallery and Mary Kremen, who's here today. Um, and as a project, it consists of a number of related elements. Um, there's a temporary sonic event to mark the high and low tides of the river, and this will happen in September 2021. And I'm currently conducting a series of workshops and sound walks with the local community that sort of allows and sort of provides a space for people, the local community to, to think about the river through its sort of sonic qualities and to think about their engagement with their own local environment through, through sound. Um, and I'm also working with uh, some acoustic ecologists and marine scientists to gather sort of the, the sort of sonic data from below the surface of the river. So thinking about anthropogenic sounds, human made sounds below the surface of the water. And really I was trying to use this as a, as a device um, to think about the, the familiar and unfamiliar. So it's, I'm trying to think about the construction of, of place and, and the idea of place making um, through unfamiliar, unfamiliar means and, and the way of using this sort of sound or sonic in, environment was a way of maybe equip, equipping the, the, the locals to sort of achieve that or think about their own particular place uh, in a different way. Um, I'm currently developing a website for the project that, you know, maybe what's different about this project and the other projects is that this is a temporary commission and as such there's a, a sort of opportunity to think about how, how to give something that operates in a temporary way, in a sort of ephemeral way, um, more permanence or more sort of longevity. So I wanted to to create an archive or database of all the, the recordings that are being gathered by myself and by the local uh, participants um, as a way of sort of giving that a duration and a life beyond the project. And it's due to be launched in the next couple of weeks, but um, it'll be a, a rolling sort of ongoing interface or, or site of engagement for people to to listen listen to, to the recordings that have been uh, gathered. So, And in ways, I suppose this recent project reflects a shift in my own practice towards a more collaborative um, research practice. But it also maybe addresses some of the questions being discussed today, such as making work in and for the Anthropocene and thinking about the embodied energy of materials and material practice, and maybe the role and responsibility an artist's work in, in a public context has when thinking about these things. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. Um, that was great. Um, it just really struck by the relationships um, that you describe between the, the invisible and the, the intangible <clears throat> and how that then manifests as a material iteration, which is an artwork. Um, and, um, you know, just some of the things you mentioned there at the end regarding sort of responsibilities to materials in an sort of anthropocene, uh, and in, in context of the Anthropocene, but maybe in terms of um, decentering the human or um, trying to approach materials from, um, yeah, less anthropocentric uh, position. Um, so, I mean, we can come back to that a little bit later, but I just uh, thought I'd sort of, you know, uh, reflect on some of the things you said that really resonated for me. Mary, do, um, you, you worked with David on the project um, in, in, in Derry. So um, I wonder if you had anything you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I guess for us, um, it was a really important, it was a, a commission that we were doing around the Walker Plinth project, um, which again has been, I mean, it's something that when you work in the public realm, you, you, you lose a lot of control over certain aspects of it. Um, and it's kind of changed over time. I think I think that's another thing when you're working in public projects. Uh, there was two commissions with Alan Phelan and David Beatty. Um, but over time and during COVID as well, um, everything has has been delayed and, and the projects have changed also, just even in terms of, of location and talking about um, 
politics of location, um, even the sites of, of where the projects were going to be located has changed. Um, outs, well, kind of outside of our control, really, but I guess, you know, it's, it's something to do with the politics in the north uh, and the complexities of that when you're trying to approach sites. Um, it was initially supposed to be uh, positioned on the Walker Plinth, uh, which is quite a controversial space in Northern Ireland. Um, the column was blown up in 1972 by the IRA. So it's currently owned by the um, Apprentice Boys, which is the, uh, essentially the Orange Order here. So um, I had done previous commissions there and we had a very good relationship with, with them. But um, at a point uh, when we were talking about, I think it was last year, uh, when a lot of the kind of monuments in places like Bristol and this kind of question of... Um, post-colonialism and decolonizing these type of monuments, um, a lot of the apprentice boys became quite concerned about what I was trying to achieve was the idea was to reclaim the Walker Plinth as a public space um, for both publics, both, both sides, North, you know, Catholic and Protestant. Um, and for them, uh, that space, even though it was a, it's an open space, there's, there's nothing there. Um, it was really kind of um, representative of a certain um, point in their history. So even by us occupying that space was problematic for them. So um, we've had to move the location of, of that as a result. Um, so I guess things can be contentious as well. And even those kind of spaces that you don't, you know, for me, I saw it as an opportunity because it's this amazing location. You could see the sculptures from all over the city and there would be sound. And, um, but for them, it was kind of much more kind of loaded um, location, even that empty space. So um, yeah, so I guess it's that, you know, that's one of the challenges of working in the public realm that you have to come up against these issues. And that level of consultation with community is always kind of quite key as well. Um, and it can change. So uh, that was our experience. But uh, luckily, artists are adaptable. So we've been able to adapt the projects and change. I mean, David's hasn't changed that much in that it was always going to be around sound and around the you know, the rhythm of the water and things like that. But for Alan Phelan, it was a, it was a relocation of his piece completely. So um, yeah, so there are the, the joys of working in the public sphere. <laughs> so I'll, we'll, I'll pass you on so you can introduce um, Alice. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, David, again. That was really great, a really great insight into your practice. So I'd now like to introduce um, Dr. Alice Rekab. Um, Dr. Alice Rekab's practice is concerned with expressions and iterations of complex cultural and personal narratives. Alice Rekab takes their own mixed race Irish identity as a starting point from which to explore experiences of race, place and belonging. Over the last 10 years, Alice Rekab's practice has centered around collaboration and interdisciplinary work from which they produce film, performance, image and sculpture, creating new intersectional narratives and objects for exhibition. So um, whenever you're ready, Alice, um, to share screen. Great, thank you so much, Barbara, and uh, thank, you, thank, you, thank you for having me to you. So I'm gonna share my screen now and um, while I'm presenting my shared screen, I'm going to turn off my camera, but I'll turn it back on when the video is finished. Thanks. So, uh, for my presentation, I'm going to move between two sites of public monument. The first is, in a, is a film that I made of the Tent Memorial in the Sierra Leone Peace Museum in Freetown, where my father is from. And the second is my own public sculpture commemorating the revolutionary sacrifice of 1916 and the legacy of Skolena and the Pierce Museum in Rathfarnham in Dublin, where my mother is from. I will then talk a little bit about the infrastructure of remembrance and monument making and how violence and conflict is memorialized, reflecting on the civil war in Sierra Leone and also on my own research in the commemoration of the Irish centenary and the construction of Breaking Emmett's Block at the Pierce Museum in Dublin. I'll be thinking about the privilege of making and remembering in your own way and in your own voice and also thinking about Ireland in the context of a post-colonial state still grappling with the outcomes of its own civil war. 
The first piece I'm going to show you is an extract from my work Conjuncture in Film and was exhibited at the Stanley Picker Gallery in London in 2017. The part of the film you're about to see documents a conversation I had with my guide Ibrahim Conte at the Sierra Leone Peace Museum in Freetown in 2014. In the film, we are standing in the Memorial Garden, originally constructed on the site of the International Special Court, built by the United Nations to try the war criminals responsible for the atrocities of the Civil War, both in neighbouring Liberia and Sierra Leone. A civil war that made my grandmother a refugee and killed many of our extended family and friends. In the film, you will hear Ibrahim explain to me the process through which the tent memorial was commissioned. And he will also describe the additional and as yet unrealized elements of the sculpture and their significance. So without further ado, uh, let's go to Freetown. And the tent there reminds us or memorializes the hundreds of thousands of Sierra Leoneans who were displaced by the war. You know when people were displaced, they live in tents, whether in country or as refugees in neighboring Guinea and in Liberia. A lot of them live in tents. So that one reminds us that this is what Sierra Leoneans went through. They had to live in tents. And then we have the tombs in memory of uh, those who were killed, the tens of thousands of Sierra Leoneans who were killed in the war. The peaceful, we have to fix it with a white flag. But at the end of the visit, as one of the last rituals a visitor could perform, if he wishes to, is to perform, is to offer a sacrifice. This is what we have as phase one. When we go into phases two and three, we we'll fix two fountains here, and the fountains will be shaped like a gun, and then we will be having water oozing out of that fountain. It's symbolic because water, they say water is light, say like 70% of our body is water. That is what it symbolizes. Another importance of uh, this uh, uh, memorial garden is um, the first attempt as a country at symbolic reparations. Do you have someone who whose job it is to come up with the, symbol, with the symbolic uh, reconciliation? Well, um, what we did was to have a memorial design competition. So we put out a public competition and then we invited entries from members of the public. We had four winning prizes. So we, had, we collected the entries around the country from all over. We even had entries from Germany. Once, once we had the entry, we put together a, a, a panel of judges. And that panel of judges uh, decided on the winning entries and when once the winning entries have been decided on it was realized that none of the entries including the four winning entries or even the first entry had all of the features we wanted to have in the memorial gardens okay. so they decided to have a final entry taking on board all of those features we wanted to have in the memorial garden including even some of the features that did not make up the winning entries so this was how it all came about. Okay. Will those artists, the people who designed it, will they come and build it? Or how does that work? Will they come and supervise the building of it? Or is it, how, how does that no, come they together? No, don't, they don't supervise anything. The, the panel of judges decided on a final entry, taking on board those features we want to have. Then we had, we, bring, we brought in people to, from the special courts, the general services department to help us design. And we also, came in with people from um, the engineering, one engineering firm. I don't have the name now on top of my head. Yeah, so they actually helped us um, putting this one together and also even the Peace Bridge. Oh, this is the Peace Bridge? Yeah, that's the Peace Bridge. That's one. That's 
So um, as an artist, um, kind of having this conversation, I was immediately struck by how alienating the process of the commission sounded on the one hand, but equally how it was somehow ultimately very democratic and this kind of strange amalgamation of multiple proposals um, decided by a committee and executed by engineers. A kind of combination of a total openness in terms of a global competition, not requiring specialist knowledge necessarily, in contrast with this kind of unilateral decision making by the panel of judges to kind of bring together different elements that they liked and sort of uh, redesign them into a single monument. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing to sort of encounter and it was not a conversation I expected to have in that moment. Um, uh, I was also struck then by, in a lot of ways, how alien um, or transplanted that particular mechanism for commissioning and memorialization felt. This idea of uh, the first attempt as a country at symbolic uh, reparations, this idea of how um, you know, building a monument to a national intergenerational trauma like that in this enclosed space that's quite separate from public life felt like an idea that might have been generated in a European boardroom and, execute, and it was executed using foreign aid and perhaps to satisfy foreign appetites for visibility and virtue signaling. And I wondered afterwards uh, what the outcomes of a more indigenously generated and maybe locally engaged process might have looked like. So this encounter with the tent memorial made me ask in the context of my own work also what it is to commemorate, memorialize and to reconcile violent and fragmenting moments in our histories and to consider what an impossible task it feels like uh, to produce something that is universally or um, readable and meaningful but also representative of an individual's art practice. And it's uh, from here that I want to take you from the Peace Museum to the Pierce Museum to look at my uh, public memorial, uh, Breaking Emmett's Block. So uh, this sculpture was commissioned by uh, South Dublin County Council to commemorate the centenary um, of uh, 1916, but also to memorialize the site of the Pierce Museum at St. Endes Park, which had once been home to Pierce's experimental educational project, Skolena, a school modeled on a vision of Gaelicness, an attempt to decolonize the minds of a generation of Irish youth through engagement with and creation of an emergent Celtic imaginary. The sculpture itself, Breaking Emmett's Block, is named after an exhibit in the Pierce Museum called Emmett's Block. This is the very butcher's block that um, Robert Emmett was publicly decapitated on in Thomas Street uh, in um, There we go, sorry. <laughs> Thought that was coming sooner. Excuse me. So uh, yeah, so um, yeah, the sculpture is named after this exhibit in the museum which is uh, a table made from the butcher's block that Robert Emmett, a revolutionary of the 19th century, was decapitated on by the British in public on Thomas Street in 1803. So the block was bought by Pierce's mother and turned into a table and was gifted to Pierce. Um, and uh, after the rising, uh, the uh, didactic plaque on top of the block um, shows an image of uh, Michael Collins signing the first bonds of the Irish Free State, and it was toured around the country as a way of promoting um, the sale of, of, of Irish of, the, of state bonds. Um, and so, in that sense, it became a kind of a, a touring monument of its own. This kind of integration of a previous revolutionary's place of death and the uh, and the uh, birth of the new of the new state. Um, 
so uh, yeah in 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 kind of responding to this public commission i um i wanted to respond to that symbolic defiance um through of the use of this block as a table um but also to the act of violence that it infused the object i also wanted to respond to the uh, to the follies that dotted um the estate so these follies uh were built by the uh House's previous owner, a British landlord who had an interest in Irish megalithic tombs. So they are a completely new 19th century kind of oddities. Um, and they also then, um, when Pierce and his family took over the, 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 the building for the uh, purposes of creating the school, became the sites for, for Pierce's kind of quite, quite famous idiosyncratic engagement uh, with um, Irish mythology through pageantry and uh, and the in involvement of the students in these kind of pageants reenacting Irish myths. So there's this kind of uh, idea of a very, very personal interpretation um, peppered with real artistic imagination um, and this idea of, uh, of remembrance. And somehow these two ideas were brought together in the creation of this concrete megalith um, with lightning kind of seeming to strike out of it and into it at the same time. And uh, yeah, um, I kind of wanted to sort of capture this, this kind of madness and paradox of the generative destruction of the revolution and that kind of energy and impact that these seismic shifts create in our social consciousness. And in the context of this presentation, how this optimism and ideological grandeur was also so short lived and fragmented in the civil war that followed and whose legacy uh, that our post colonial and um, like our post colonial siblings in Sierra Leone lives in a very real way for many of um, this country's inhabitants and, and the island's inhabitants in that. And finally, I guess in juxtaposition of these two monuments who are in and of my practice respectively, I wish to close with a number of considerations on the privilege of memorial making and what infrastructure and what the infrastructure of memory making is and what legacies of representation do we inherit from our colonizers and what do we inherit from our ancestors and how often these two things become enmeshed in the moment of post-colonial emergence and the construction of the narrative of a new nascent state. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, thank you for sharing <clears throat> that presentation and your work. Um, so just really, again, um, thinking about the work and actually the form of sort of almost this performative lecture, I suppose, that, that you've just presented, um, it really interrogates, I think, crucial issues um, about the complexities and responsibilities involved in producing memorials and monuments that confront our uh, complicated uh, post-colonial histories. So um, I'm really thinking about the, the idea of marking sites of commemoration and um, the, the mining of histories and, and confronting post-colonialism and uh, ideas of identity, nationhood, and the decolonization of monuments. I think it's really interesting, Alice. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's um, it was a nice opportunity to kind of bring those two sites together. I had, um, you know, the film and the visit to the Peace Museum happened in, in 2014, and then the commission happened in 2017. And, um, it was a really interesting thing to sort of have that film sort of become kind of part of the consideration in the production of, of a monument of my own. Um, and it was an interesting thing. Um, I almost, when I was designing it, was just really, really interested in this kind of formal engagement with, this, with these kind of ideas of energy and sacrifice and creation and destruction and this kind of single moment, but also this idea of sort of fabricating a mythological moment. Um, so there's the, the, the the work sort of approximates a number of different sort of archetypal kind of images. Like it's kind of like Zeus, it's kind of a dolman, it's kind of a spomenic from Yugoslavia. It has these kind of multiple sort of faces. Um, and uh, when it was opened, one of the things that kind of really struck me is that the, the, the mayor of Tala laid a wreath on the sculpture. And that was not a thing I had anticipated at all. Um, I do actually have a little photo of that if, if you'd oh, like. Please share it. it. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. I think I think that that's very interesting. And I think that um, 
you know, myself and Mary were having a chat actually uh, in advance of this. And, you know, we talked about some of the unexpected things that happen in response to public monuments that we might make as artists. And, you know, I suppose in a way we're very accustomed to being with artworks. Um, and these sorts of really emotional or, you know, intense encounters that the audience may have with them can be surprising, I think. Um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was like this moment that sort of brought it back to death in this really way that I hadn't really uh, expected. Um, David, you were actually there, which I really like. Uh, so you, you witnessed the laying of the wreath. Right. Um, but so yeah, it was like a, a completion of the commemoration, right? Yeah, By yeah, yeah, like, that's that's what people do at these kind of uh, annual events where they commemorate. Yeah, uh, like Poppy Day or something. It had suddenly become in, in, enshrined in this way um, mm -hmm. that I guess no one talked to me about it. Not that it would have been something I felt like I had to be consulted on, but because I didn't expect it to happen or know it would happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then it did. And it was kind of, uh, yeah, it kind of we sort of focused and redrew down this kind of energy of commemoration um, when in many ways like the sculpture also represented to me like a celebration of 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 like the exuberance of of saint enda's and um and the um i guess also the the invitation to to bring my whole self and imagination to respond to this really interesting piece of history and this really interesting site and that focus on the celebratory element of it was then sort of kind of checked by this laying of the wreath and the remembrance of um of of the sacrifice and 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 what it meant also to the community um, because it's obviously not not a typical memorial in, in any kind of sense of, of of the word yeah but i guess that's the difference in terms of what the you know what the brief is and then what the, what the artist's intention what it what it results in is is often quite different i think Mm. Um, and I, I think that that whole question of legacy of representation and representing histories and the, the problematics of trying to commemorate something. I mean, we've definitely, you know, currently in the north where um, it's the year of 100 years of partition. So it's a very difficult thing to commemorate or, um, you know, it's not something the wounds are communities want to celebrate and other communities don't. So it's a very different uh, experience. So those kind of post-colonial questions that you're talking about are always, are still very relevant to here. So um, I'm conscious of time, so I think we, we, we'll move on and I'll introduce uh, Eva. Thank you so much. Uh, Eva Rothschild was born in Dublin, Ireland. She received a BA in Fine Art from the University of Ulster Belfast and an MA in Fine Art from Goldsmiths College. Her work is predominantly sculptural and she works across a range of materials, including aluminium, gesamite, leather, fabric and perspex. She has a material based studio practice, but also works on major public and outdoor commissions. Her work references the art movements of the 1960s and 70s, such as minimalism, and is also informed by the contemporary aesthetics of protest and spirituality. In 2014, she was elected Royal Academician. So welcome, Eva. Hi. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. I thought it was really good to listen to your presentations, David and Alice. Um, I suppose I'm just, hang on. Yeah, I'm just gonna, yeah, okay. So I'm hoping my share will work. My, um, yeah, so it's interesting listening to the different approaches here because in a way I approach things very differently. I am, as you say, Mary, a very materials-based sculptor. I can't imagine ever being on anyone's list to memorialize anything. I think that that's sort of not, you know, there, there's different kind of strands in how public sculpture works. And also, I guess I should say, as a kind of almost manifesto point, that I consider the act of putting art out in the world to be a sort of public placement regardless of whether it's in the gallery or not the difference is there's a kind of social contract when you walk in the door of the gallery like when you go to the theater you've decided to come and view the public sculpture is kind of plonked on people whether they want it or not and uh, the nature of my work is that it tends to be when in the public realm which is the sort of how people seem to talk about things the realm as if it's like a kind of magical world um is that um, it tends to be really big. So one of the things that I am really interested in in making public sculpture is trying not to do the plonk 
and you know just put something in everyone's way that they don't really want and they're kind of um kind of it's like a block in the landscape my approach in doing public sculpture really is about trying to consider the social present and the social future of a location perhaps rather than the past and i think it's interesting to know in a way that um you guys are Irish artists still living in Ireland and I'm an Irish artist who decided to leave Ireland quite early on. And I think that I wonder how that affects our, our sort of feeling in relation to things as well. I think that's quite, um, I do for me, that's quite interesting. I think uh, there's some message here. I don't know what it, uh, is, it, is it that important? It just came up on the screen. I didn't read it all. Not important. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that's quite interesting in listening to both of your presentations. So anyway, I am going to just go through some works and I'm going to finish up with something I'm working on at the moment. So, um, which I think I'm not really supposed to show anyone, but anyway, here we go. So, um, yeah, so as I say, I'm, I guess my, when I approach public sculpture, it really is about thinking about how to kind of foreground and place the sculpture in a way that it becomes part of a kind of community engagement and that it becomes something that people perhaps use in a way, you know? So anyway, I'm gonna just go through a whole load of, well, there's not that many, I'll go through them quite quickly. I'm just gonna set this up and then, hang on. I'm just gonna, oh, hang on, I need to do the share screen first. Sorry, I'm quite useless at this. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, can you see my desktop? Yes. Okay, can people see that? Yes, yeah, good, okay. So, um, yeah, so obviously I've started here with the show that Mary and I did together in, in Venice. And uh, so that's kind of public, not public. Um, you had to pay to get in, so I guess that counts as not public, but you know, it was pretty available to people. And one of the things I really wanted in that space that was that when people came in, they didn't just see the work, they were kind of with the work and in the work. And one of the things um, with the piece Amphi here that you can see um, people sitting on was that I wanted something that created a way for people to be kind of part of the work. So their kind of own bodies and their presence were sort of implicated in the work. So they became part of the work and part of the sort of active kind of the, the sculpture being active to the next people coming in. And it sort of provides a kind of invitation to the materiality and the presence of the objects. Um, so there's a picture of some people sitting on that. Um, this is a piece which was in, um, I sort of put this in because this is a real example of corporate placement that would not have been my personal placement of a sculpture. So this is a large object based sculpture which you know is very much about a piece that people see and they interact with it through their eyes and potentially it would have been fantastic to have interacted with it through the body, but the nature of the commission was that they wanted to place it on a traffic island. So that's what they did. Um, but for me the kind of act of looking at this sculpture I suppose then became the primary focus of this sculpture because you kind of couldn't really approach it in in many ways and while this is a sculpture I I really love as a piece you know for me that that sense that no one could be with it was was a bit of a it made it less successful for me in terms of its role as a public sculpture it was only available really to the eye and I think a public sculpture should always be available to the body and to the group. Um, these are, I've put these in works, they're outdoor sculptures. I'd love them to be more public, but they aren't at the moment. But again, they're pieces that made a kind of, uh, a sort of location. I see public sculpture as creating a location. So this piece was in uh, Milan. And again, with the objects here, they're kind of variable. They can be set up in different ways. And actually, I totally forgot, I haven't got a picture of it, but this did actually get placed in a public park where it was, very much a sort of became a location for people to be within. Uh, again, this is another piece of school nature and culture. Um, this was a piece which kind of bridged the gap of being able to be indoor and outdoor and created a sculpture, which is something you'll see in all of the things I'm doing now that 
you can't just you don't just sort of look at it because that's not for me a kind of um especially with the public work it isn't a big the idea of just looking at something isn't isn't enough it, it's something you can be within and that you can sort of move your body in relation to and you can be with others within so ideally for me a public sculpture should create create a social space um here's another piece i've just put together this piece is called this this and this and actually was probably the first large scale outdoor sculpture I made that's about five meters high just to give a bit of context and in terms of unintended things that happen one of the unintended things that happens on this is it was used for skateboarding a lot which you know I don't really mind um and this is a piece empire which was a central park um again with this I wanted something that you know, it creates a gateway, it kind of creates a new, I suppose, a new threshold for something, a new engagement with an old, an old sort of old favorite in terms of an area or a space. It creates somewhere where, I mean, you can see people meeting here, somebody's obviously waiting there. That sense of somewhere where people are in the familiar, but it's changed by there being a, a different object there that perhaps doesn't resonate with the other objects there. Um, this is a terrible picture of probably the most, this is the most recent outdoor sculpture I've done. And for me, it is the most successful in many ways because it really does do what I wanted it to do um, in that it, um, it absolutely has created a location for people to be in. People go here, people meet here, they have events here, they, you know, I'm very interested in the idea of like the amphitheater of outdoor meeting spaces and this piece for me which is called my world and your world and is in um it's in king's cross in london so it's it's the first sort of uh permanent public sculpture i've had um in in the uk where i live so it's it's you know quite significant also because it's in the city i live in and um it was it actually went up at the beginning literally during that first quarantine period in the first three weeks of the of 2020 it was 2020, wasn't it? Anyway, where all this madness started. Um, so it was installed and there was supposed to be this big kind of, you know, here's the sculpture, it's amazing. And this sort of event, but there was no event. There was no nothing. There was just barriers and it got done and it was a miracle it got done because of all the restrictions. And then it's just been there. There hasn't been a thing for it, but it's sort of grown into itself. And also in a way for me, what has been in a, almost quite moving is that due to our um reliance on outdoor spaces as as our only sort of continuous social space during this uh during this pandemic this has really become somewhere where people meet and they go to and people send me pictures of you know it, it gets tagged all the time with people being there doing things having you know little parties and things and that for me has been a kind of source of um yeah it's it's a really joyful thing to have been able to kind of happen at this moment of uh sort of misery for in a lot of ways so for me that's been a kind of bizarre unintended that's what i wanted but i didn't really imagine it would have the significance it did so the sort of situation changed in a way that made something that you know was hopefully going to be significant for the location um anyway become more significant so that that has been actually quite yeah quite moving almost for me so um next one sorry this is just a close-up which shows you the um the sort of construction you know i mean i think that a lot of my work that people see in galleries is often quite sort of uh what would you say like it's quite harsh in many ways perhaps it's not that welcoming when I approach public sculpture, I don't want it to be unserious. That's not that's not an issue. I don't want it to be unsculptural, but I do want it to be welcoming. I do want it to um, to activate the body. I do want it to activate the social space. I think it should be generous in its in its presence and in its transformational ability for the space you know it it shouldn't be something that is just as i said there to get in your way it should be something that you as a member of the public perhaps living in that 
area, working in that area, um, sort of engage with in a way that becomes maybe, you know, and perhaps it sounds very sort of, you know, hopeful or asking too much of art or whatever, you know, that it becomes something that enhances our experience of, of the public space. And often the sort of touchstones I think of in relation to making art are the sort of um, meeting places. I mean, for me growing up in Dublin, the two meeting places on the two sides of the river were the Cleary's Clock and the Trinity Gates. And that's where you would meet people, you know, if you were going to go going out or if you were planning to do something. And they were very much sort of these kind of landmark places. And the idea of creating landmarks or creating meeting places is really central to my practice in outdoor sculpture, I'd say, rather than sort of public, because I sort of believe it's all public. Um, I'm just going to finish up with, uh, oh, these are, this is the piece, um, which I don't know, is this more public than other works that were in the show? It's more interactive potentially, but you know, it's something that I guess increases people's sense of um, agency around their, their um, engagement with sculpture, their sense of um, ability to perhaps affect sculpture, to be part of something, to experience it very closely and personally. Um, so these kind of curtain pieces I've made, this is at um, Visual in Carlo, which uh, I think was open for the princely sum of three weeks before it closed. So maybe somebody saw it, I don't know. Um, but, you know, these, these again are things that sort of ideally bring people closer to a feeling that they are absolutely legitimate in their interpretations of sculpture, in their engagement with it, in their ability to be part of an exhibition and to be part of the sort of experience within a sort of artist created environment and that they're active within that. And these are just some other works I made like this, which I, I wanted to show. And I suppose they bring in, I suppose the idea of an expanded practice, because that's something I'm really interested in. The idea that a practice moves and it takes in more things and that you know, you can make something and then offer it to someone else for them to bring their own kind of way of making to it. So here I worked with a choreographer, um, Jo Lloyd in, um, this was in Melbourne and she made a, a kind of pretty huge choreographic piece with a group of dancers and performers within the art, the exhibition I've made. So here, the sculpture you're seeing, which is this sort of curtained room, sort of looks like, yes, of course that could be designed for, um, for, an, for dancers, it could be a set or whatever, but this shows in a way the most stagey part of it. The rest of it was her uh, choreography and her performers actually really just being extremely free with the other artworks in the exhibition, crawling all over them, doing whatever they wanted. I didn't have any hand in her performance. So that sense of I guess an expanded practice and bringing a different audience to it, perhaps that dance audience is also, again, a way of increasing, I suppose, a public engagement with sculpture and, and working on that idea of the expanded practice. The costumes here I also made for this. Um, and then I'm just gonna move on to, <laughs> this looks a bit mad uh, for all of you, I'm sure. So in the last year, I have been working on a uh, something I've always wanted to work on, which uh, for me is kind of the absolute sort of uh, apex of what you could do as a public sculpture. I'm making a playground in um, Barking and Dagenham, Dagenham in a public park. And uh, so I've been working on that for um, the last year and it's actually just been made now. And I'm just showing the kind of I suppose as well, because one of the things that happens around making public sculpture, which is different than making our own work in the studio, is that, uh, and, and it is our own work, is that there's generally a brief, a call for participants, there's a, a client or a commissioning body, whereas when we make our work in the studio, I guess we kind of do what we want and we push it out there and see what happens, but there is a process usually that relates to public sculpture and how we approach that uh, it is something that's quite interesting to me. You know, sometimes for people, it, it's sort of coming from a position of historical research or interviewing people in the area 
or looking at the, you know, the, the topography, or it's about our experiences in location. So this, all of these things are brought to bear on public sculpture. And this project for me was really interesting because it's in a public park. Um, so it's not, even the King's Cross, it's a public park, but it's within one of those slightly strange kind of public private new developments where there's security guards everywhere. Whereas this is literally a council run park in the middle of uh, ordinary borough in East London. So it is, it is really the definition of public. So um, one of the things I wanted to do, these are just my kind of drawings for this piece and I'm just gonna show you the final kind of thing. It's not made yet, it's literally, I went to see it yesterday. But um, one of the things I really wanted to bring, I suppose that was bringing something from home was, um, I don't know if any of you recognize this pyramid, uh, which is in Kalini Hill, which has this uh, beautiful couple from some kind of stock photograph sitting on the top of it, looking out to sea. Um, and then I've got some pictures of my children when they were younger and my niece standing on the top of this, as anyone who knows this uh, structure knows all children do. They go up there and they stand like this and they feel like the king of the castle and they kind of own the world. And it's something that I did as a child and I've seen my children do and I've seen countless children do and I've seen so many people taking pictures up there now that people take selfies. And there's a sense of this object that was built, I think it was built as part of um, uh, projects, you know, for famine relief. And uh, it's, it's become something that is really quite, um, it's just such an activating object and it takes on this form of the, you know, the most kind of, uh, you know, one of the most original forms of pyramid. And I really wanted to bring this sense of activity to, uh, to the idea of a playground. And uh, so that's something I'm working on at the moment. You can see the ridiculous models here made from toys. These are Minecraft. I mean, these are, this is, definitely something that is catering for an audience and a specific audience because it is kids. Um, so I'm just going to show finally just the uh, work in progress because it's very present in my mind and, and uh, it's a very different thing for me to do at the moment. Um, and it, it has all these um, caveats to it because everything has to be safe, everything has to be playable. It has to be looked at in certain ways. So there's all these things that come to bear on public sculpture that we as artists are, are trying to work around. So in this case, it's me trying to work around the, the idea of adventure, play, social space. I'm very interested in how teenagers use parks because they are obviously a, a group that are, people don't actually want in parks. But I mean, why shouldn't they be there? Of course, they need to be able to use it. So all of these things become really sort of germane when you're thinking about making a sculpture that rather, I mean, especially in this case, rather than being just to be looked at, is actually absolutely to be inhabited by the body and by multiple bodies. And also we know will be used in ways that we haven't even anticipated. So I just wanted to sort of bring that in. I guess it's like almost the sort of opposite end of the scale to the idea of memorializing. Um, and. Uh, these are just some pictures I took yesterday and I'm very excited about this piece, although very nervous because obviously I haven't really made anything that, you know, actually people have been uh, encouraged to be on. Well, we made the piece together, Mary in Venice, and even that had all its health and safety stuff. So this is a terrifying almost, but that sense of being able to try and make an object that really goes into the world and has to be robustly present there is for me, one of the great sort of excitements of doing outdoor and public work. Uh, I'm done, thank you. I'm just gonna try and get out of this now, hang on. Great, thank you, Eva. Thank uh, you so much. Okay, cool, thanks. That was yeah, great. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see um, that kind of staging as well of your work. And I guess, you know, in the last year and a half, where public space has become so important to us, and that's the only place that we can kind of meet people and, and things yeah. like that. And prior to that, I like even when we were working on, on Venice, uh, we were talking a lot about, you know, those kind of bollards and things that they were yeah. like, trying to stop you being in spaces. But now it's, it's really kind of 
I totally forgot to put them in. They're my more aggressive public outdoor sculptures. There's one in Glasgow at the moment. So, I mean, it's easy enough to look up. But um, yeah, I think I was overwhelmed by yesterday because I literally went to look at that sculpture yesterday by the sort of idea of play and excitement. But yes, last week or two weeks ago, I was installing the sort of Bollard public sculpture, uh, which is outdoors in Glasgow, which actually is much more about the idea, of course, of control and sort of the signaling of kind of power in public spaces. So it's it's very different in its in its iteration. I mean, that would not have been the right thing to put, you know, in this park. This park needs to be for the park users so that they get the maximum sort of sense of ownership and agency and um, kind of sense that like, yeah, this is for them. It's, it's, you know, I'm sure obviously people will hate it. It's not about people loving it or all wanting it, but the sense that something has been considered thoroughly and, you know, really in relation to, you know, what could happen here. I think that's really important. Yeah, and it's all about the importance of reclaiming public space. Yeah, social space. And I think especially, I mean, as you know, Mary, I'm really interested in social space for teenagers and groups that people see as, socially undesirable as well you know I mean in designing that sculpture I you know know that the top levels of that sculpture will probably be inhabited by groups of teenagers on evenings you know that people might not like that but that's a place to go it's very highly visible it's not um it's not hidden away it's it's going to be lit you know, so it's kind of like saying like, oh, you know, these pe people can be here, you know, during the day, yeah, the kids can go there, whatever, but in the night, like, why not have somewhere that feels like, you know, because there's so many, there's so much kind of social engineering around trying to avoid making space for mm -hmm. older teenagers and youth, you know, and I, I think that it is really important that in our public spaces, we, um, we make space for those people where both they become visible and non-threatening because we need to change our attitudes but also that they are aware of their visibility and and that visibility then hopefully brings some sense of response not responsibility but a sense of their that yes they are here within society not sort of hidden away in like you know the old-fashioned victorian shelters we have in the parks where it's all kind of you know like you're inside and it's a bit dark you know to make somewhere that actually feels like there's a sort of an openness of presence and, and that we, you know, people are allowed to be there um, mm. and to try and make those spaces less threatening, I think mm. as well. So people aren't scared of their public spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm struck even by the, the you, was, you used the word amphitheater during your talk there and that you were very interested in this idea. And, you know, I was thinking about the, the role of your social sculptures, I suppose, um, in maybe creating some kind of agora. Um, and encouraging yeah, yeah absolutely like mm -hmm. a gathering of people and um i suppose just to to consider you know how sculpture these sculptures and um, sort of just calling them social sculptures can facilitate moments like that that you're describing or give visibility or permission to certain communities to to gather um, yeah i think that's really important and i think it's funny living in london where a lot of people don't have gardens and I guess that's the same in Dublin too, but, you know, I grew up in the suburbs, so I hadn't really, you know, and it is, it's true, as you grow up, you realise different things. I just kind of thought everyone had a garden because I was so privileged growing up where I grew up, you know, but now I live here, you know, loads of people don't have gardens. And, and also, you know, people really use outdoor spaces here in a way that I think that you know, people have weddings in the park, they have like social gatherings in the park that sort of, I certainly wasn't seeing that happening when I was growing up because I grew up in a very suburban environment. And so I think that, but I think that that, you know, had I maybe stayed in Dublin um, and moved into the city center, which always would have been my aim, you know, I would have become more aware of that. But, you know, living in such a built up place here, you are really aware and also particularly through the pandemic, but even like not with the pandemic, how, you know, if somebody wants to have a, a wedding or a, you know, christening or a communion mm. or anything like that, you know, they do their thing and then they set up some tables in the park, you know, they, 
that yeah. is a very kind of done thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that with the sort of use of public spaces through the pandemic, I think that, you know, if there's only one positive thing we can take from that, I think it is the sense of ownership of public spaces. Mm. I ha haven't had the, you know, good fortune to be in Dublin for nearly two years now. But, you know, I was in Glasgow a few weeks ago and I was, that was not a big kind of park using city uh, compared to say living in London, I used to live in Glasgow. But I was really struck by how the pandemic has, you know, brought people outside, you know, brought mm -hmm. people to the park, you know, I mean, and I think that, that that sense of ownership of the public space where a public sculpture can heighten or kind of give extra, this is a really weird phrase, sort of locational value to a yeah. space. I'll meet you at the, I'll yeah. meet you at the fountain, I'll meet you at the sculpture, I'll meet you at the, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that sense of sort of being able to name a space yeah as, exactly. our, as ours is really important and I think the best public sculpture should allow that to happen you know yeah it's that, like a kind of spatial vernacular or something that it becomes like fluent in the city it's like a yeah based uh, language like you know and, and I think a lot of cities have those kind of specific meeting points and often they are you know um related to architecture or or artworks um yeah and I think that we can do better with those spaces. There's an amazing uh, public artwork in, I think it's in Oslo, by Jackie Donachie. I don't know if you know her, she's a Scottish artist who does a lot of very publicly engaged work, who has a really interesting practice. And she made this piece there, um, which is called South. And it's just amazing. It's like a big um, disc, yeah, a concrete disc. And it's, um, it's, I think it's 60 centimeters high or it's a, no, no, it's lower than that. It's like 45 centimeters high. I'm just looking at my stools to check the height. It's the height of like a normal stool or chair. And it's a big concrete disc, um, like about 10 meters across and it's heated. Yeah. So in the winter in Oslo, you can yeah. sit on this or you can lie on this and you get this heat, you know, it's not, it's like, how yeah. lovely, how generous. Yeah. How, That's how an amazing public sculpture, you know? Yeah. It's a comfort object too. Yes, you know? exactly. But it's concrete, it's hard, it's sculptural, right. it's almost brutalist. Mm -hmm. That is a welcoming space because it gives this physicality, you know? Mm -hmm. And it gives this sense of like allowing you to do something you perhaps couldn't do without that artwork being present right. there. For me, that is probably the most successful public sculpture I'm aware of in terms of what I'm calling a social sculpture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Eva. That's great. Um, I, I have a, something that's come out of what, what you've just said, Eva, but I think it would be useful to maybe uh, bring in the other panelists too on this question. Sure, yeah, yeah. Something that occurs to me really often. Um, this idea of when we talk about public art, um, you know, and you know, he, certainly here in Ireland, we're really fortunate in that our public galleries and our public museums generally free to yeah. enter. So yes, you enter into a social contract, as you said, to, to, to go inside that you're there. The intention is to, to view art, whereas, you know, I suppose things in the public realm and, um, you know, uh, you encounter them, you know, on your way to work, you're not necessarily, you know, uh, visiting them in the same way. Yeah, so they're there whether you like it or not. Yeah, right. So I'm just wondering how everyone else felt about this idea of, you know, um, you know, what is public in terms of making um, sculptural works, you know, do, do you regard, I suppose, public galleries and museum spaces as public spaces in terms of your own practices? And, it, and is there any shift around um, the, the methodologies or artistic concerns when you're making um, things in, that, in, in those two spaces? Apart from all of the engineering ideas, the health and safety and all of that, mm -hmm. just thinking about the artistic concerns um, around publics? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that idea of social contract is is correct. You know, the, the idea that you enter into a space that's been pre-decided, predetermined as as this cultural space and you're, you're, you've made that decision to enter that room, you sort of expect that cultural engagement. So, so maybe that's the difference between entering, you know, what we do as, artists we we make them public so whether that ha happens in a gallery or happens outside of a gallery is 
it's all public. But absolutely, the, the idea of, of how the public engages with it is, is quite different. You know, you've pre, pre-decided I'm going to enter a gallery space and therefore I'm sort of open to being questioned, open to this sort of relationship with, mm-hmm. with what's being presented. So in, like encountering something on your everyday or, or not expecting sort of this unexpected encounter, I think is, is what's interesting about, or the difference in terms mm-hmm. of thinking about the different publics. Um, and maybe as an artist, as you approach that, it's, there's a nice sense, like a really sort of interesting sense of, of release or, or sort of, of letting go of that sort of constraints or sort of restrictions around what you might sort of control within a controlled sort of environment of a gallery. And when you put something into the public and it's it's there, you've sort of signed off on it. It's, it, it becomes this social space. It becomes this thing that you don't really have a control over how it's interpreted or how it's engaged with. And it becomes something that gets climbed upon or skated upon or graffitied. And they're all part and parcel of what the work is, you know? So. Yeah. And also, I suppose, this idea of permanence. You know, I mean, generally, when, when work's produced for a a gallery a museum space whether it's public or private you know it's on it's on display or it's on view for a, you know a predetermined period of time so there's something temp the temporality of, of these works in the outdoor environment is different um this idea of a permanence and and i think everyone here is familiar with this thing of you know the the object must be you know robust for 20 years and all of those things and what's the the maintenance schedule and all those kinds of documents that make me really kind of stressed out you know oh um, my god don't try and make a playground yeah right i mean I, I can't even think about what that might entail in terms of the health and safety uh elements uh, it's terrifying but it's yeah. like so exciting to do it and i am so excited by it and we have you know everything has been done as it should be done but it is a really quite a scary thing. I mean, of yeah. all of the things, it is the, yeah. because, you know, it's, um, it's just, uh, it's kind of something you're giving over to the public more than anything else you could give, you know, I don't, uh, you know, in terms of the object. And I think that it's like, uh, that, that is really, um, that is really quite, it's so different than doing anything else I've ever, ever done. And it is, um, it, it is like, a, it's a very, very different thing. But I think that, yeah, I mean, obviously with public sculpture in every way, it is, a, it is something that, you know, it has to be done super professionally and you have to have all the right people to work with and everything has to be done correctly. And I think that actually it is quite good that those systems, I mean, those systems do exist pretty robustly and that's really important. Yeah. But there also has to be a sense that every artwork is essentially like prototyping. It's not, you know, by definition, it's not something that most people have tried to do before. So therefore, it's kind of, you know, usually the, you know, even the use of methods and materials are kind of experimental. Mm-hmm. But those are the more prosaic elements, but they're really important. Mm, yeah, they are. There's that el- element of risk, right, when you put something out into the public and, and if it works or if it doesn't work or, you know, if there's yeah. a level of, you know, is there a level of failure in it or, or not? Yeah. And, and well, not how it occupies the space, you know. Well, that it could fail. It could be, you know, it could be sort of successful initially. But I mean, who's to know its uh, potential for for being a failed uh, object in ten years' time, even? You know, also, I mean, you know, things move on as well. And I think as well that you know, the other thing is about as an artist putting things in in public spaces is in terms of sort of, I mean, not to sort of go too far on it because but you know like you are opening yourself up to a lot of criticism you know like people might love things but they also hate things and people Mm -hmm. are you know they don't hesitate to have a go at you about it if they hate that so you have to you know be I think you do have to feel that you are making the right proposal you know like I've I've been not you know the certain things come your way and you just go I wouldn't be the right person for that, you know, because putting something 
in, in the public realm like that. You know, you can't consult everyone. You can't make art by consensus. Well, maybe the piece in Sierra Leone, that was really interesting because I was so struck by that process, was so far from what we would consider, you know, the idea of authorship, ownership. And, and it was really interesting because obviously you talked about that, you know, and but like when I was listening to you, Alice, yeah. sorry, I think you're on mute still, are you? Um, I just, it was kind of like nobody's sculpture, but everybody's yeah. sculpture had this yeah. um, very strange, um, yeah, just different dimension of, 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 its, of its being. And, and also, um, I don't know if I spoke about this too, too much, but it's kind of totally enclosed. It's in a compound. Yeah, so, you could see that. Yeah, it's like a high, it was a high security facility that is no longer high security, but yeah. all the infrastructure is still there. So there's barriers, but you can just walk around them. There's no one policing it, but it's still, it's just very little was done to the space. It was a courtyard that was allocated for this thing to happen and, and, and it was executed in that way. And it's kind of interesting. I mean, in response to the, to the question, I guess that, that Barbara began the, the discussion with, I sort of think in terms of my own practice, I think about like the work in my studio is, is like, immediately corporeal it's about my body and my family yeah. and then I think about like the public sculpture is about the extension of that into the social and um and in like one of the things I guess I don't wouldn't say I struggle with it but it's something I'm aware that like every public sculpture I've ever made looks really different from each other and looks very different from what I make in the studio yeah and I think I do. really to do with um kind of it being really very much about responding to that specific thing. Yeah. And that thing is going to be really different mm -hmm. every time. And so um, there's definitely this idea of um, a sort of a demand for consistency from artists in some ways. And they yeah. want like, the Alice Reca for yeah, 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 and, yeah. And, yeah. And reduce this, but big. Or, you yeah. know, yeah. Do, yeah. do the yeah. thing that you do, but here and bigger. And for those yeah. people, yeah. Know, and actually, ideas. that's often a, a criteria for public um, commissions is that it should be somehow and, you know, it, somehow representative of the artist practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it can be, it can be hard to reconcile with the with the brief based nature of public public artworks. Sorry, someone's ringing my doorbell. It's the perils of Zoom. Apologies. Um, so. So, yeah. So I guess this idea of, of consistency, Alice, that you speak of and that, that the artwork has to respond to site or community, um, but may also have to represent the artist somehow too. I, I think it's really interesting that as well, because I think that um, one of the things that happens with making public sculpture, especially at scale, is that, so in my studio, I make the artworks, yeah? Like, I mean, I need other people to help me and I have to get other bits made of them. But, you know, you can see there something on the table. I'm going to paint it. And, you know, I didn't weld it, but I made a model and then it's quite small and I'm going to paint it and then I'm going to varnish it and I'm going to have to lift it up and I'm going to have to move it around. So I have this totally direct, um, yeah, like corporeal relationship to that. And then I just had a show and, you know, all those works like, we cast them, we made them, we polished them, we fettled them. Some of them were only assembled on site for the first time. So there's this sense that as well, you can keep on changing them. If I paint that one color and I don't like it, I'll just paint it another color, you know? But with the, with the, um, the, nature, the nature of an outdoor sculpture or a public sculpture is such that you have to make a model and then it has to be done you know through some computer program then it all has to be checked and then there's engineers and all of these things happen so in a way one of the things that I kind of like don't like about being about making public sculpture is it's kind of strange because sometimes they are quite different when I went to see those playground structures they were sort of frighteningly bigger than I had thought they would be and uh, I kind of wanted them to be big but I was a bit like oh my goodness these are really big and and then the other thing is that like one of the kind of amazing things is you kind of get to be the audience for your sculpture, your public sculpture, your outdoor sculpture in a way that you never get to be the audience for your studio made sculpture. I don't know if other people find that. With the studio made sculpture, there's always the sense that you could change it. You know, you could 
move it along you could bring it back to the studio yeah. and do something different yeah but like with the outdoor sculpture once you're you're done you're done yeah. that is it onto that's fabrication that's it yeah really. you know and that like, sense like... of but therefore <laughs> you can be an audience for it in a way that like when i look at that piece in king's cross i can go and go oh this looks like this and that you know but when i look at my other sculptures i'm like oh i should probably move this bit and i should yeah do you know what I mean? There's a sense yeah. of distance that's actually kind of quite nice as well, in a way. Yeah. What about, the, what about the staging of the works in terms of responding to like site or I guess a lot of people feel that sculpture responds to the architecture that it's placed in. Mm. So how, how's that addressed? Because your work is your work and then you put it out into the real world. Um, and then the architecture, whether it's in a park or, you know, on a roundabout, as you said, or, you know, like how does that impact uh, the making of the work or, or the staging of it? Well, for me, it's usually the first thing is you have to look at where it's going to go. And then you, you, um, I can see you guys nodding. Yeah. And that, so in a way, that's the, I mean, that's almost the basic. It's like being given a plinth and then told to make a sculpture for it. You know, it's like, you have to work out if that's going to mm. work. Mm. A very odd shaped plinth with grass and people and Course. yeah and in some ways like like you know the, the brief based nature of public making pu making outdoor works i suppose is like a comforting restriction there are a series of comforting restrictions in a way it's like you know you can't there's some things you just can't do there's sort of an experimentation yeah. that can't really happen so it, it present like the bound they're like useful constraints or something sometimes um provided the constraints are not too uh, constraining well, you know, like, suppose, <laughs> and sometimes they are you know and, and those are the sorts of uh those are the sorts of briefs that are they're harder to respond to i think but um, I mean, that's what they were talking about um on the panel yesterday i think where we were was and and they were highlighting going the brief is the most important thing as a commissioner yeah. that you have to get the brief right and then it goes from there but that's the kind of essential key mm. starting point yeah but I um, think that like those parameters exist if you're making work in a gallery or in a space anyway, you know, you, yeah. you're considering the architecture, you're considering the body in, in a space and how you might move through that space or how you might approach the work you've placed there. And those sort of decisions and decision making, it's quite a similar process in many ways to mm -hmm. how you might approach something in an outdoor space or a social space. So. Um, so yeah, there are things, different types of parameters and different sets yeah. of rules, but, but I think it is quite a similar process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've often seen, I always see it as, as, as a much more radical space to work in, in the public sphere. I don't know if people feel the same, but I just think even just in the, in the process of commissioning or producing that it's, there's much more points of change or points of interaction, or even when it's there, then the, the, it, it just feels, like within a gallery space, it's it's kind of, it's a safe space almost, it's a known I space. I don't know, I yeah. feel kind of differently. Like say with that piece I showed at the first where they put it on the traffic island, it was like, there was quite a big gap there between what I had thought we were gonna do, mm. you know, and what their idea for what a public sculpture would be was, you know, they wanted an object on a traffic island, you mm. know, so, it does depend on on the client as well and the and you know i think generally there would be much more yeah i think if you have somebody who's like developing a really public space or a city council or something like that there's usually a bit more kind of sense of like what could we do mm. you know rather than the idea of wanting a decorative object yeah you know yeah um, and i think that and that, one of the problems sometimes though then is the timidity on the part of the commissioner in terms of actually feeling like they need to there's sometimes the worst situation is when you do something and you feel like the body commissioning it has done it because they feel they sort of should and they won't kind of loudly and proudly own the fact that they're commissioning mm -hmm. public sculpture. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also, I suppose, um, you know, when we're talking about this idea of public, I suppose it also does matter who's the commissioner, you know, yeah. so 
I think you've gestured to that there, Eva, and, and, and you know, that there, there are processes that are, say, connected to planning permission for uh, housing development, yeah. commercial developments, and that, you know, the production of a public artwork is attached to... Yeah, the and they don't really want them, you know? It's like, oh, God, can we get this done, you know? Maybe not, so that exactly, that there becomes a slightly different engagement there with the artists, with the process. Whereas, you know, I suppose the more potentially um, um, some of the other opportunities that come through, say, you know, um, like, uh, I suppose, uh, government agencies, uh, county councils mm. are quite different um, because yeah. they're, they're the sort of like those, those particular opportunities are, you know, in a way owned by the people. And it feels it's more holistic as well. There's more of a sense of like, yeah, it, do, it just really depends on who the who the client is. I think sometimes if you feel that someone's arms being twisted to get in a piece of art, mm. you know, uh, yeah. and there is that. I, I see you nodding, Alice. But, yeah, I, I'm <laughs> laughing at the memory of being asked to put a sculpture in a flower bed because um, they actually changed their mind where they wanted it, and in the meeting me saying, well, I mean, you can pay me and we can just get rid of the sculpture if you want. <laughs> and and uh, it was not put in the flower bed. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, just kind of thinking about all these and and because of the diversity of stakeholders in these in these situations. Mm -hmm. and, and also that, you know, on any given panel, you know, it could be quite a close tie between one, yeah. one commission and another. So you could be actually yeah. working with someone who did, did never want to do there. Exactly. Um, they yeah. have to have you there because exactly, the yeah. democracy is such that, um, and that can, so you come into a situation where there's already a sense of you not being wanted and you yes. not being able to take I've had that, yeah. You are, and, um, because of these kind of mechanisms. And that mm -hmm. was also why I kind of wanted to show that that film, because um, in some ways it's really alien, but in other ways, maybe it's not as different as it we was think. Interesting. And there is that kind of idea of what the sort of um, the the back end of the kind of operations and decisions and politics of these mm -hmm. kind of um, yeah. missions is that as an artist, you don't really get to see. The no. feedback you get is very safe um, mm -hmm. and it's always yeah. written in such a way that there's nothing you could ever say. <laughs> um, right. to, to, um, you know, it's not a document that you respond to. It's a document you receive and accept. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and sort of thinking about like those kind of closed spaces of decision making and, mm -hmm. and kind of how power operates within them is kind of uh, something that is, I think, is really relevant. Um, and there isn't a lot of knowledge shared around it. Um, it's still quite a closed mm -hmm. thing. And I think that that's kind of interesting. And the and the outcomes of it and the experiences of it are what we are kind of talking about with these yes. kind of weird conversations we end up well, having. Right. And I think it's like unusual for artists to speak more publicly about that. I think we do converse about it privately with one another, of course, through our professional networks. And, you know, we have that level of sort of covert sharing around what the process is and how the things go and the experiences we have. But I think, you know, it is really interesting and probably important that we talk, you know, publicly about public processes because, you know, um, yeah, there is a degree, like, of course, there are power structures involved in all of this. And, and generally speaking, the artist is not, um, you know, as you said, Alice, this idea of a document you receive, not one you respond to in a way like that, that sometimes, you know, um, artists mightn't have the sort of agency that others do in these processes. Um, I, I don't, I just want to, I mean, I'm conscious of time. So I'm looking at the time. We have two questions in our Q&A. So one's quite long and multi-part. So um, shall we maybe turn our attention to those um, uh, or even another one? Oh, okay, so we have three. So we'll, we'll try and address um, the questions in the Q&A uh, if we can. Um, so um, uh, Tanya has a message here saying, um, David um, said about the exploration of sonic qualities was a way to think about the river in a different way. So um, just wondering who has this need, the artists, um, academics who live far from using the river, maybe the local population uses the river and is aware of the river's sound. So I suppose that's for you, David, if you wanted to respond to that. Sure, yeah. Um... I think I understand the question, but um, yeah, I suppose think about the sonic environment, whether it's the river or not. Um, but for me, the, the river, I was using the river as a sort of vehicle or, or a thing to think about. Um, as Mary was talking about earlier, this sort of contested uh, plinth, the Walker plinth space, yeah. and to maybe 
to think about the politics of place by almost avoiding it. Um, but to think about the river as this connecting body of water rather than a divisive body of water. So that's where the river played the sort of central role in sort of anchoring a lot of the, the thoughts around the project. Um, is, I mean, there's rivers in many cities and places and, and it's often marks the border between one place and another. And, and there it's a very contested space, uh, specifically like it divides the land mass between the UK and, and Ireland and Southern Ireland and, um, and, and it also divides that city. So a, a city of Derry and Londonderry. So, so yeah, so I wanted to think about that, but also to think about how sound is a sensory thing and it's one of many senses and how we experience life or experience time is through sensory experiences. So to maybe move, to sort of avoid sort of the sort of dominant non-visual sort of means of thinking about how you remember something and, and something that is maybe quite saturated with images in terms of the city of Derry and your sort of the thoughts of you're thinking about Derry as a place, it's it's through the media, it's through what you might have seen in, in its history. So I was trying to maybe give permission to to myself, but also to primarily to the locals to rethink about their connections and their sort of um, their ways of sort of navigating and experiencing their own local environment through sound that might trigger other ways of of re research, like thinking that type of topology and type of typography of, of what that space is. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, David. Um, so, um, uh, we have actually a couple in the question, sorry, in the, in the chat box too, sorry, I'm like trying to multitask here. So, um, we have another question about um, reducing the, the scary aspect of making work interactive. Um, so I presume, I mean, we may have addressed some of that already in terms of uh, um, briefs and health and safety. I think that's just a quite pragmatic question possibly. Um, I don't know if anyone wanted to respond briefly to that um, question. Um, what I suppose, what's the role of the commissioner in, um, you know, creating such interactive works? Ones that, I mean, I suppose. What um, what do you mean by interactive? Do you mean yeah, that? You know, can I just say? I would just think that all artwork is interactive, whether right. you interact with the eye or the body or the hand mm -hmm. or yeah. the brain. So yeah. I think that you know, I think that the challenges around. I mean, I am assuming about the 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 question when it says scary aspects. The scary aspects is the sort of level of audience participation. Mm -hmm. and also the sort of physicality of works you know in the gallery there's usually someone who can go can you stop doing that you know mm -hmm. or uh can you leave or um you can't eat your lunch yeah. there you know whereas right. like in in the public space that isn't the case so mm -hmm. the work has to be robust you have to take professional advice you have to work with an engineer you know that it is like yeah. building a house you yeah. know preferably not with mica in it but you know Right. It, it needs to be, it, you kind of have to, you have to realize, I think, when you're doing a public sculpture that, that you can't make it. You know, me with my rudimentary knowledge of mold making, uh, which gets me by in the gallery, is not yeah. going to get me by in the street. Right. So you have to take, you have and to do things professionally. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I just think that, you know, this, the, this, the structural engineer is the, is the, is the person who um, completely um, validates that process, you know, and, um, you know, yeah, that's, that's, you know, this discussion around loads, I suppose we've all had these conversations um, from making artworks um, around what the load bearing capacity of things are and how they must be anchored to the ground. And it is kind of interesting and the, the forces that are times such and such to, to you know, to account for various um, forces is really interesting. Um, but I think there are processes in place and um, other people that we that we draw into the process to sort of sign off on those things. Um, so um, just another question here about the briefs, but I guess we've kind of covered that too. It says, have mm -hmm. you ever had a brief that was the best you've encountered? If so, what was it about uh, and what made it the best? Oh, I know the best ones. The first ones are when somebody goes, I really love your work. Do you want to make a proposal? 
What's the best? <laughs> oh, really? And, and, no, and no helpful restrictions? Yeah, sometimes that's good. Or, you know, they just give you the site and the load bearing and they go, do you want to make a proposal? And then they say they'll, yeah, and then they're obviously, the best ones are the ones where they pay you properly for the proposal as well. Right. <laughs> okay, that's a really good point, actually. Eva's just brought up there. And I think... Um, you know, I think that in, I think here in Ireland things have been have improved immensely in terms of yeah, what, yeah. what what artists are paid to make proposals because we all know the kind of um, the kind of ma you know person hours that go into making proposals for public sculptures yeah. are it's enormous you know and um, the the rendering of of visuals yeah. of videos of making maquettes um, for even just the conceptual sort of underpinning of the work it's a huge undertaking in pages and pages of documentation so I think that yes um, I agree I think that some of the best ones are the ones where you're paid really you know appropriately for, for your the, time yeah to the proposal actually and that then bodes well for the engagement that happens yeah. afterwards um, you know there's a level of respect that's absolutely implicit then in the process for your time and for your work um, so I mean, I, just in terms of bad things I have had I think my worst experiences have been where I've had a proposal like a long time ago when I was much younger and I was not, it was not that established and I felt very lucky to be asked to propose on something and I was asked to propose on something and quite far down the line, somebody came to me and said, mm, the minister doesn't like purple. Could you take purple out of the sculpture? <laughs> and I said, oh. no, anyway. And, uh, then the other thing was somebody said, I said I had to charge VAT. And they were like, oh, if you charge VAT, you must be turning over quite a lot. Um, and you're just like, this is like my main job. You know, yeah. it's not my choice to charge VAT. It's a legal thing, you know? And then you're like, employ like somebody you're and I have like a living somehow. You're just like, what are you thinking? You know, anyway, the project didn't go ahead and I was very happy, but it is like, you know, the sort of things that people come to you with and, and they sort of, you know, I mean, now, cause I am, I'm older, people don't tend to ask me such ridiculous things, but I think the artists at the beginning of their career or tentatively stepping into this area, they do need to kind of hold out, you know, don't do a proposal unless they're gonna pay you um, whatever, I don't know what it is in Ireland, like a thousand euros or something, or at least 500 euros, just don't do it because you're not, you need to tell them that you are worth that. And I think the artists have to be very clear on those things. And actually in Ireland, when I've done projects, one of the things I'm really struck by that doesn't happen here is you always get paid a fee no matter what you do. And that is amazing in, in terms of, I'm talking about showing in exhibitions, you do not get that in other countries. And that is really great. Yeah, and it means hopefully the artists, even young artists are aware that they, you know, their work, their labor has value right that's really important and it's i think signals, that, um that's you really know important. artistic work that it's it's a it's a job it's a vocation and it has it has value it has um you know it has a our time is valuable and then our time has has worth um and one other thing is really important as well to get a solicitor to look at your contract yeah oh right Maybe. okay these are that yeah i think that's a that's a good point. I mean, just about checking off legalities and the pay again, the work and paperwork that goes into some of these, um, you know, these these projects is quite substantial, and you can't do it on your own. And it is about recognizing what your skills are and what your um, capabilities are and knowledge is, and bringing in a team of people to to support that project. Um, but even like, in terms of time, I think, you know, a lot of the leading projects, you might have, uh, it might take three years to deliver a public yeah. sculpture. I think people maybe aren't aware of the, the level of commitment that an artist has to give to a project as well. Yeah. Uh, in terms of time. I've been given a leading of, of six months is kind of often what they ask for. You know? <laughs> like, oh, do you think I've got it made already? Like, just waiting for you? <laughs> and how many times do you get a proposal and they go, oh, yeah, no, we just started looking for some people. And do you think you could get us, like, just even a, quick thing by like next week and you're just like <laughs> no yeah the, it, it's it, it's quite lengthy you know it is it's it, these things do take time and I think for for especially for engagements that are fully thought, thought through and robust you can't really you know you can't really substitute okay. 
no, you can't fake those things. Um, we've one kind of a couple of questions here in the chat, but we should also consider wrapping up shortly because we're slightly over time. Um, so thanks everyone for a thought provoking event. What would happen to the public space works discussed if they're accompanied by text? So I suppose this is a question about mediation of public artworks. Um, how might this replace the frame of the gallery for an unfamiliar public or perhaps sab sabotage the experience? So this is a question around mediation. Um, I'll just leave that, you know, it's, 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 for you, does anyone want to respond to that? Yeah. Um, the experience? Uh, with the the, the uh, Pierce Museum monument, I, I because I'm bilingual, I, I wrote like a, a kind of a, a piece explaining kind of what the heart of the work was and, and what its inspirations were and connecting it to the follies inside the park and sort of just trying to draw those lines and kind of cons and for the public. And I was just like a bilingual little um, stainless steel sort of, uh, it almost looked like a music stand and it was sort of off to one side of the of the sculpture. And it was there if people wanted to read about it um, in, in Irish and in English. And it, but it wasn't like so close to the sculpture that it had to be seen at the same time. And, and I felt like because the sculpture is quite weird, um, I felt like it was like um, that I owed it to a curious uh, public to mm -hmm. kind of have something so they could plug into that story that I was yeah. trying to tell. Mm -hmm. um, whereas like the sculpture at the lair is much more formal and architectural um, and that didn't really require any explanation. It's kind of doing its job by being on the building and working in the ways that it does. So I think it also depends on kind of um, how complicated the story is if you're trying to tell a story yeah. or, if, or if it is like a formal thing that sort of um, it is what it is and you see what it is. And mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of how I, I feel about it. Um, but certainly in the context of that memorial, it felt really important to at least talk about where the sculpture was coming from. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and most people, actually, no one has said they didn't like it. And everyone, while I was installing it, people would stop their cars and be like, this is great. And so this is how I kind of do my um, my QA for the public. <laughs> and it hasn't been vandalized. Consultancy, public consultancy. Yes. Um, thank you, Alice. And thank you, everybody. I think we, we probably have to wrap up there because we're slightly over time now. Um, but I just want to say thank you to, to all of the panelists today for such um, generosity and um you know and sharing your knowledge and your practice with all of us um so and also thank you to mary kremen for co-chairing with me and for your insights into public practice um and again just to thank the artists um david Beatty, alice Reckeb, and eva rothschild it was really great really enjoyable um so everyone that concludes the session and just a reminder for uh, the attendees that the next conversation is public art and environment mapping hacking and sensing and that takes place here at 2 p.m so look forward to seeing you back here there for that okay. thanks thank again you. everybody thanks thank everyone. you bye, Take bye. Care. thank you bye.